Hello, I'm Sarah Worley, founder of The Key Clinic, and I'm delighted to welcome today, hero to many, legend, British astronaut, Tim Peake. Tim. Hello, Sarah. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you. And today, what I wanted to speak about was the link between the balance mechanism, gravity, and symptoms of dyslexia and dyspraxia. It's been an interesting journey going into space and then coming back down to Earth. and it certainly plays havoc with the balance system. So it's a subject that's definitely close to my heart. Can you talk us through a little bit of what actually happens then when you do go into space? How, how does that get dysregulated? Yes, well, but there's a, actually a syndrome called space adaptation syndrome, and it affects most astronauts for their first day, maybe two or three days. Um, and really, it, it can have symptoms of nausea uh, and, uh, and balance issues because what's happening is your inner ear is very confused. All the fluid rises in weightlessness and it's just floating around in weightlessness. So it's now giving a false input to the brain. You've lost all proprioceptive input from your muscles because you're just in this wonderful state of floating in weightlessness, which is lovely. Um, but the only reliable information going to your, your brain is from your eyes. And it takes a while for your brain to figure out that it's the eyes that are gonna give it the best source of information. And whilst it's trying to figure that out, <clears throat> of course, this can lead to symptoms of nausea. And then am I right in thinking that once you've learned to dissociate any message from your inner ear and you're just relying on your eyes to know where you are, it gets then very difficult to become motion sick? Yes, yeah, and I, I didn't fully appreciate this until um, about four months into my mission where I was doing a task one morning, emptying the air out of water bags. And the easiest way to do this is to grab a water bag and spin yourself around so that the water goes you know, one way with centrifugal force. And then you squeeze it like the bagpipes and let all the air out. I realized I'd been spinning around for an hour and a half and didn't feel dizzy at all. Uh, so then I did a, a sort of informal experiment where I got my crewmate to spin me around as fast as I possibly could and absolutely no symptoms of nausea, but also when I stopped, no symptoms of dizziness either, which I found incredible. I mean, that's just extraordinary, isn't it? But to me, that's a brilliant example of neuroplasticity, yes. of the brain learning very quickly to adapt and ignore input from one area and just focus on the other one that's going to be most helpful to you. And then you're coming back down to earth mm. and having to relearn things. I mean, what happens when you, when you come back to Earth? Coming back down, um, for the first 48 to 72 hours, I felt quite unwell with nausea, with vertigo. Um, and the whole uh, vestibular system is now going into overdrive because we're back in a gravity environment. So our eyes are still giving us the same input, but the inner ear fluid has now gone back to a normal 1G environment and the proprioceptive system is kicking in as well. So our brain is now getting all of these extra inputs that uh, it has to start you know, fusing together and processing. Uh, and that can be a very uncomfortable period where you just feel very unwell. So to me, that bit is extremely interesting. Because if we are working, for example, with children or adults with dyspraxia, you know, it makes life extremely difficult to navigate. And it's fundamentally because that balance mechanism isn't linking in together. And I think the other thing um, I wanted to talk about in particular was what happens to the eye tracking? Because I think a lot of people are unaware that there is this link between how your eyes track and move and gravity. Yes. And when we go into space, this is something of, of concern because it's quite difficult to actually judge um, you know, spatial awareness. And then when we come back down, of course, as soon as the gravity environment kicks in, then you can have um, nice nystagmus and, and this flickering of the eyes. And then, you know, the, the reason that, for example, children and adults, um, one of the reasons that contributes to dyslexia and, and poor eye tracking is to do with retained primitive reflexes. So this is something we work on at the clinic. Um, but it's, if you have retained reflexes, they directly interfere with that balance me mechanism, that inner gyroscope. So we often find if you can fix that, if you can get rid of the retained reflex, suddenly the eyes are able to then track smoothly. Yes. Did, did you or do any of the astronauts ever have any experience of what I'd call dyslexic-like symptoms? Yes, uh, and this was quite interesting when we were coming back to, to Earth uh, and the re-entry process is 
it's quite violent. Uh, it, it's, it is fun. It's like a, a, an incredible fairground ride. But you've just spent six months in a zero gravity environment. It then enters Earth's atmosphere. At that point, you're still having to monitor spacecraft systems, uh, make sure it's functioning normally, reading procedures. And that is, is very difficult to do in, in a high G environment. And you're very aware that your eyes are finding it difficult to actually make sense of, of some of this information. A lot of that is compensated by the fact that we just know our procedures so well. We're doing it by rote memory. But if we were just having to rely on our eyesight alone, it would be quite difficult. That is literally what happens with a, a child, for example, at school that's struggling with dyslexia. They're having to compensate. Yes. They're having to memorise. Their higher brain is having to work 10 times harder than it needs to because the autopilot's not turned on. So, yes. you know, when we work to get rid of these reflexes or to in integrate them as the correct term, we do it through these slow, controlled neurodevelopmental exercises. We're just trying to get rid of those underlying neurological blockages that, that get in the way to make it easier for people to be able to, yes. I guess, access their full intelligence rather than having to compensate, compensate for something that's not quite working as it should. Mm. So, so how did you hear about the Key Clinic, first of all? <laughs> it was actually an interview you did with Chris Evans, um, Radio 2, I think, and it's something that we're fascinated to learn more about. And as you said, there's absolutely no stigma attached to it at all. It's, it's actually incredibly interesting to know more about how the brain works and how we can make it perform better. Thank you so much, Tim, for coming in today. It's been an amazing, incredible conversation and I'm delighted to have had you here as our guest. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. It's been great.